Okay, well, right, we're going to start. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Kainwen. Um, This is our seventh Shine Connect. It's our third year online. Um, we do have about, we've got about 30 people joining us this morning, which is great. Um, we've got about 400 people registered for the whole conference over the next week, which is amazing. Um, so we've got 33 sessions. You can pick and choose from whatever sessions you like. Um, so there's obviously other sessions throughout the weekend. You can pick and choose, um, join whichever ones strike your fancy. Uh, we will be recording most of them. And um, so if you miss something, you'll be able to catch up um, online via the conference platform. So, um, and I'm Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, well, we started Shine really because of our own experiences of having cancer as young adults. Um, Carmen and I both found it really difficult to meet other people our age that had been through similar experiences. And then we also found like a massive gap in the information that was out there and the support that was available um, just for the things that we cared about. So at Shine, we're always looking to discuss topics like fertility, dating, working after cancer, um, looking after children, mental health. Um, and this conference and everything we do at Shine is really about filling the gaps in information and support around those topics, but also connecting all of you with people who really get, um, you know, what you've been going through and what you're still going through. Um, so if you're new to Shine, welcome. If this is your first Shine thing that you've um, that you've logged into, we're really happy to see you. Um, do make sure that you check out all of the other stuff that we offer as well. Um, we've started going back to in-person events. So there's obviously still quite a lot online, but there's lots of different programs, information, um, and lots of stuff to access on our on our website too. Um, and we're we're really excited about all the sessions we've put together for this year's Shine Connect. So we've got 33 sessions. Um, one that we're really excited about for today is obviously this session, um, but also we've got a great keynote speaker at two. So Professor Wendy Garrett is joining us live from the United States. Um, she's a professor of public health at Harvard. Um, I didn't know that she would say yes when I asked her if she would speak. So we're really excited about that. Um, and she is basically an expert in the gut microbiome and cancer and our immune system. So that's all the all the bugs and bacteria that live in our gut and how they affect our immune system. Um, but we've got loads of other important sessions and also a few social sessions. So um, today at five o'clock, for example, we've got a, a just a kind of meet and hang out. Um, so if you want to have a chat with the Shine team or other people that are at the conference, you can join us then. Um, and well, the theme for this year's conference, we try and have a, have a theme every year. Um, and the theme for this year is the stories of young adults with cancer. Um, so we've got sessions throughout the week. They're called the spotlight sessions, if you're looking at the agenda. Um, and basically, we're, we've asked different people to come along and share their experiences, talk about their story and how they've coped with diagnosis and treatment. So look out for the, the spotlights throughout the agenda. And, and to kick off, actually, to kick off the conference, that's exactly what we wanted to do. And we are really grateful to Jesse and Kieran, who you can see on our screen. Hi, guys. Um, so they have joined us to tell us um, a little bit about their story um, or their stories. And so we're going to start with Kieran. Um, so hi, Kieran. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, I just got a little bit nervous last minute last 60 seconds so um but no I feel I feel okay I feel okay no we're really we're super glad that you're here and you are joining us from Clapham is that right yeah I'm I'm in I'm in Clapham South London at the moment it's where I live okay great and so I've got my notes saying that you are a football fan <laughs> oh that sounded like an open door no is that an open door or a dog I'm not sure <laughs> I um, thought it was a football going into the goal. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Um, so you're you're a football coach. Um, I think you work with kids. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I I'm the last year I, I changed career um, and now I coach kids, predominantly twelve and thirteen year olds. But my overall uh, spectrum of ages is four to fourteen. But oh, wow. I, I, I specialize in eleven, twelve, and thirteen year old boys and girls. 
Right. I feel like that's very cute at four and then maybe slightly less cute at 14. But yeah, they, they take your soul at four and five years of age. You have to give yeah. everything to them. They, yeah. they need you. It's not just about the games. It's about you. So I've done it, but it's not it's not what I want to do long term. Great. Um, so, yeah, we're really grateful to you for joining us today. But can we just start off? Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what you were doing with your life when you were diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was thinking. <clears throat> I was thinking about it last night. I said before we came online, like I was speaking out my speech, and um, I think one of the reasons why I stopped, apart from feeling just a bit kind of a bit mad talking out loud, was that it was like a different person. It didn't feel right to stage manage it and talk to, talk about this <clears> life <throat> as I was <clears throat> because it's not who I am. So where I was at the time I was working 60 hour weeks um I was doing 40 45 hours in the office 15 hours at home I was working on the train I had a two hour commute there two hour commute back that's you know Ooh. I was coming back on can you hear me yeah, yeah you're still here don't worry <laughs> well I was doing 20 hour commutes I was in the gym with a trainer four or five times a week that's another 10 hours of traveling and commitments as well. I was cooking. I came home, I did, there was, this was before Uber Eats three, four years ago. So I was cooking all the time. Um, I was, I, I had another thing going on in my life. I was in recovery for it, for addiction, which was going really well, um, which I'm not gonna go into too much, but that was a major focus in my life in terms of living a good, healthy, clean, balanced life, healthy people, healthy surroundings. I was literally, I was about to open my own business with uh, a colleague at work. We had decided it was, it, it was the time. And uh, we had this sweet spot where, you know, we had time at work to start investing in building our own business. So um, I was looking for a flat. Um, I was interviewing for jobs elsewhere to get the pay rise, to pay for the flat while I opened my own business. <clears throat> um, I was getting closer for a girl, something was, was, was kicking off there. So overall, I would say my life then was jam packed. It was fulfilling and I was in control. And so tell, tell us a little bit about what happened then. What were you diagnosed with and, and kind of how did that play out? Yeah, so um, I was, I always suffered throughout the years with insomnia, not, not officially diagnosed, but I had issues with falling asleep. So. I was up one night reading the book, Candles Lit, and it was my, my routine at two, three. If I couldn't sleep, this was my go-to. I felt a dull ache in my testicle, so I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. It was very peculiar. It didn't worry me that much. I went to the doctors the next day. She said, it's probably a cyst. I dealt with things at that period in my life because I was in a good, good moment. So it all just happened. And then she said, you know, let's go to the ultrasound on the Monday. This was a Thursday. And then in the Monday morning, um, she said uh, the, the the doctors did the the ultrasound and then injected me with some dye and I saw all these colors flash up around my balls sorry my testicle and um yeah I, I knew something was up but I still funny enough I still didn't think cancer and then they sent me down to the emergency um phys 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 surgical specialist and he just said yeah I'm 99 percent sure you've got testicular cancer so we're gonna have to operate and move your testicle next week which they did 10 days later um and then on the surgical bed, when they were rolling me in, I had six months earlier blocked a certain type of numbers, like, you know, the telephone marketing numbers. And for some reason that blocked the hospital. So they told me on the surgeon's bed that they, they were hoped it was stage one, but it was actually stage two A. So it spread to my abdomen. And I always remember it because they said, so you've, I asked, so what my percentage is, because I'm a percentages guy. Mm -hmm. And they said, so you've gone down from 99% five year survival rate to 92%. And that, and that was that was like a huge thing um, for me at the time. Um, and then, yeah, so I had the surgery within 11 days of being diagnosed. And then I had a, I took a bit longer to recover than I think the average for some reason. And then six weeks later, I started chemotherapy. Um, and yeah, I just paused there because that's, I don't know what, what where mm. to, keep, to keep going on because it kind of, it just went a bit murky then in chemo so um how long I, were you doing chemo for 
Yeah, so I did chemotherapy approximately two and a half to three months. I had 21 sessions. It was like five on Monday to Friday on, four, five, six hours, aggressive BEP, I think it was called. And then I had the Monday on, but it was shorter. And then I had a week off. And then the same six day cycle on. Sorry, then it was the following Monday for one week. So it was seven days split over three weeks, five intensive, then one on, one off for a week, repeated three times. So it was approximately three months. So yeah, it's a lot. And so how did you, I mean, how did you feel physically, I guess, through that? Because you'd had the surgery. So you're having kind of, I guess, mop up chemo. Um, and then how were you feeling kind of mentally? Because it's a long time as well. From yeah, so feeling the, something in bed, thinking, oh, it's probably nothing to all of a sudden you're you're having surgery and three months worth of chemotherapy. Yeah. So I think quite simply that it, it literally was a f- the three stages of chemo with the three Damn weeks were split. And <clears throat> the first week physically, I felt dis- like a disaster. But in the in the two weeks kind of recovery period, I did I did recover somewhat uh, physically. It was during the second week of chemo that I, I developed aggressive chemotherapy um, in peripheral neuropathy. Mm-hmm. That really, that was really, really painful with my hands and my feet. And um, I had really a lot of problems with my eyes, with vision and uh, my ears. I had tinnitus before, or tinnitus before chemo and that made every, all my ailments became super hyper aggressive. So my ear pain was huge. And then I, during the second and third rounds, I, I, I had a mental kind of emotional problem with the whole chemo and, and cancer and fighting it and all that stuff. Um, and I went downhill. So um, I, had, I had mental health issues during the chemo. So, I mean, you and I have <coughs> talked a bit about this already, but would you mind maybe, because I think this is something that a lot of people um experience actually you know and we don't talk about it enough the sort of the mental health impact of a cancer diagnosis because obviously I think for you and for me you know I was diagnosed 12 years ago with cancer but you're sort of living your life and you never think you're going to be the sick person or you know you think you you kind of imagine that you've got years and years ahead of you so how did that impact you what what did you experience yeah sure um So I remember when before I went to start a chemo that my doctor oncologist said, so <clears throat> you're 35, all your blood test results are phenomenal, like magnesium, iron, zinc, everything is like average or above average. You have no deficiencies. Your testosterone level is 30% above the UK male average. You are literally, a, she said, a prime candidate for chemotherapy. And 75% of people sell for it and 15, 20% have mild to moderate side effects. And then she said, what two to 5% have a, have a bad run, but we don't think that's gonna be you. So <clears throat> I held that close, obviously, and I prided myself on my physical, you know, capabilities and prowess. So it was hard for me to talk to a nurse during halfway through chemo when I started to have thoughts about, basically the, like, I'd started to have flashing images of, of slitting my wrists in the doctor's surgery, like a cry for pain. I don't know what it was. It just started to happen. And then I started to think about throwing myself in front of a train um, at a specific train station. And that's basically what was going through my mind. And it started to happen like 30, 40 times a day. And then it got to the point where I went into chemo one one morning. And I, I, I know now what happened because at the time I didn't realize, but I stopped speaking. And uh, a nurse tried to engage with me a few times and said um <clears throat> Kieran you're not you're not speaking now this is a concern so we need you to actually speak so we can <clears throat> we can hook you up to the chemo and move on with the day and I finally said I can't speak and she said why not and I said because I, I'm having crazy thoughts and she said um I always remember she said what's the craziest thing you thought in the last 24 hours I just said I'm going to kill myself and that's it and uh, she says, what, 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 how are you going to do it? And I just, I told her exactly that. So she said, okay, just stay there. So then she brought in a doctor. Um, oh, I haven't talked about this in a while. Uh, then she brought in a doctor. And he's, I always remember because he lightened it without meaning to. <laughs> he held my hand and he says, okay, Kieran, I'm not a doctor of feelings, 
but I'd yes. like. To... <laughs> um, and it, and I didn't laugh because I was so <laughs> I was so depressed, but internally, I just I I it was like a quip, like a comic mm. comedian quip, and I did giggle it internally. I looked him dead in the eye. I was like, "What the? F what are you talking about, mate?" I found it quite quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's a lovely guy and I, I just says um, yeah I don't I don't want to do this no more I don't want to do the treatment I just I just want to die it's, it's just too much I can't it's 24-7 it's now it's not it's just not relenting and it's just it's constant you know, what's constant I want this throbbing in my face it, like my eyes and my ears just it's like it's just constant pain and that and that if some of Probably a few, because there's 30 people on, someone knows what tinnitus is or tinnitus. I never know which one it is. But if you have a bad day, just multiply that on chemo by a thousand. And it's just like someone's put an, a, a screwdriver in your ear and it's just poking you continuously. It was horrible. So anyway, yeah, um, that's the kind of <laughs> the grim side. And then he said, OK, so can you do chemo? And I, I just, I just was, was blank again, and and I, and something came with, from within, and I said, yeah, just, just hook. Actually, that's it. I said, yeah, just hook me up. <laughs> I said, just hook me up and let me be. Mm. And he went, he went, okay. I said, just, just minimal talking to me. And then they said he came back half an hour later after I was hooked up, and he said, we're going to send you down for emergency psychiatric evaluation at um, Thomas's. For some reason they couldn't do it internally. The specialist was in Thomas's, so I got. They get they got me a taxi, a fair play to them, or an ambulance after chemo. They called my mum and she had to she was my next of kin. I'm not married, I don't have kids. And she had to have that call. And uh I went down to chemo and I had I had this lovely woman like spoke to me for an hour. And and you know what? It's I, I'm never gonna say I was or I wasn't gonna do it because I had I had some really aggressive thoughts. And one time I did stand near near a train station. But I'm never going to say I was or I wasn't. Hopefully I wasn't. But what happened that day with her was what just what the doctor's orders, pardon the pun. Someone heard me out. I didn't have to put on the front of, not an, I don't want to say aggressive, but like, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm a sporty, athletic, proud, aggressive man in a sporting context and stuff like that. I'm, I'm powerful. My physique was always important to me. I was always viewed, not as an alpha, but I was always viewed as like a Jack the Lad, physical prowess, just like a woman's, you know, beauty is, is held up in her twenties. A man's physicality can be held up in his twenties. And it was really, really hard for me to say I'm struggling. That's what I'm trying to say because of where I came from, an Irish cultural background. We've changed a lot of society the last 50 years. For me to cry out and just cry, I cried with her for like half an hour. I hadn't cried in like that, it, it just, it wasn't the done thing. And at the end of it, she says, because when I walked in, she says, how, 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 on a scale of one to 10, how like you to harm yourself? And I went eight, seven, eight. And she, after it, she went, after the talk and the cry, it was a really, really good cry. And I've cried 60 times since then. So that was a starting point. She went, what, how, how like you now? And I was like, listen, like a two. I just, I don't feel good. And she said, you needed to talk, didn't you? And yeah, I needed, I needed to get some things off my chest. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing that because that's not, that's a lot and it's not easy. And I should just say, if anyone's listening um, today and they are having thoughts like that, obviously there is the Macmillan Helpline, there's the Samaritans. Um, you've got, you know, Shine, we're here um, today at five o'clock as well um, in a kind of chatting context. Um, but please, you know, don't feel you're alone. Um, and I think what Kieran said about, you know, talking to someone, it can really help. Um, so I will we'll pop those um, phone numbers in the chat as well as we go along. Um, but um, I, I think what you've talked about is so important because it's, it's and I always remember actually one of our trustees really early on said to me, um, she had terminal cancer and she said, it's amazing how a terminal illness can make you not want to live anymore. And you think it would be the opposite, right? You think, oh, actually, you want to fight for every minute. But sometimes it's so much and so upsetting um, that can be really destabilizing. So I really appreciate you you sharing that with us. Um, I just want to bring in um, Emma and Jesse because um, we appreciate Jesse being here too. Um, and I know Emma's got some questions for Jesse. 
I do. I think just as well while we thanks, Kieran, for, for sharing. I think the um that's it looks like some people might be having issues with seeing us spotlighted or the person that's talking being the main person. We are trying to sort that out. So hopefully you can see Jesse um Jesse now. So um hi Jesse and um thanks again for joining us. I think um as Kaiwen introduced um Kieran earlier, um we have some words to introduce you, but we love the way that you um you helped us out with that because I'm gonna read it exactly. Um so so Jesse's introduction is as described in my most recent scan reports, I'm a 24 year old right handed civil servant from East London. So welcome right handed civil servant from London. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to caveat that with it didn't fit with the words, but it was actually this right handed civil servant from East London. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's me. And are you still, are you joining us from East London today? Is that where you are? Yes. So I'm joining you from uh, my parents' house in Hackney in East London, um, which is where I grew up and where I'm kind of living at the moment because uh, my long-term girlfriend, Faith, and I have just bought a place in about half an hour further east. Um, and we're doing a bit of painting to it. And I decided that I didn't want to live amongst paint. And so here I am. <laughs> no, it can be can be a bit smelly, can't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, congratulations <laughs> on um, on buying a house. That's exciting. Um, lots of DIY to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah. So, do, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, what was going on in your life when you were diagnosed around that kind of time, and what you were up to? Yeah. So, where I sort of was in my life, um, it was twenty twenty one. Um, I'd not long finished uni in 2020 and after a sort of long pandemic year of having left uni during the pandemic not really being able to do the things that you would normally do you know move out properly um, I did manage to get a job just about um, but you know not going into the office and all the rest of it after that I'd finally moved in with Faith um, and my career was taking <laughs> off and um, I'd not long had a promotion and I was being lined up for another um so I suppose you know that kind of almost what Kieran was describing um before which was you know my life was sort of only really just beginning as they, as they sort of say you know yeah um and then I woke up one day and I had this in on in August and I had this sort of really weird deja vu feeling uh it was just really uncomfortable is the only way I could describe it. Uh, and then by the end of the day, I was having full sort of deja vu attacks is the best way that I could describe them, complete with sort of sensory hallucinations um, around taste and smell. Um, and to cut a very long story short, these turned out to be a type of seizure. Um, and my GP was really very fantastic, kind of surprisingly fantastic. And within a week, of these sort of deja vu episodes, um, I'd been diagnosed with a benign brain tumor. Five weeks later, <laughs> I was in hospital and my benign brain tumor had doubled in size. So not looking quite so benign. Um, and within a month of that, um, I had a nine hour brain surgery, the anniversary of which was yesterday, actually. <laughs> so this is a well-timed conference. Um, and by the 26th of November, I'd been diagnosed with the most aggressive form of brain cancer, uh, which is called a grade four glioblastoma. Um, and to, you know, Kieran likes his statistics and, uh, you know, mine were 25 percent chance of living a year and fewer than five percent of living five. So um, it very much relate to kind of going from a benign world of living in a benign tumor with a benign tumor for five weeks um, where you know the messaging was very much you're going to live with this forever and you're just going to have this great pub story um of, you know great introductory fact I actually have a brain tumor didn't quite work out that way but right. here we are part of the 25 percent as of yesterday yeah, <laughs> congratulations for that it's it's funny how we um celebrate strange anniversaries now isn't it we have uh, um uh, you know cancer anniversaries and um anniversaries of when we had surgery or when we finished a certain type of treatment or anything yes uh, yeah so congratulations if that's appropriate for you <laughs> thank you um, so how was your recovery from the surgery how did how did that all so 
yeah, my recovery was simultaneously like quite quick, given that it was a good old nine hour brain surgery. Mm. Um, I was in hospital for a week which is simultaneously a long time and also feels really like not very long. (laughs) And uh, I think it was a period of physically, you know, there were quite a lot of side effects, a lot of tiredness, um, but actually I did very well through the surgery um, and didn't have any neurological deficits. And the biggest thing was going through the process of being diagnosed and actually the recovery from the brain surgery itself is a bit of a blur because I was then immediately dealing with the emotions of having gone from benign brain tumour to probably not benign, but there's still some hope to, nope, you've got the worst of all the things that this could be. (laughs) And that that must have been a real shock, you know, considering where you were and, you know, you said described it as kind of starting your life you know at the beginning of everything and then to kind of get news like that must have been um quite devastating definitely definitely um you know it's I think the best way that I've ever been able to explain it to anyone um is (coughs) you know Nina Simone described freedom as a feeling of no fear and the level of fear that was brought into my life you know, it was like my freedom had been taken away. And that was the the best way that I was ever able to explain to anyone what it felt like was happening to me. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people listening, you know, thanks for, for sharing that. I think a lot of people listening will relate to that as well. We talk quite a lot about, you know, how when you're, I, I don't think it's necessarily age specific, but especially when you're kind of in your, you know, early 20s and you're, you know starting out in life you know we have this we all have this feeling of invincibility don't we that we've got you know there's maybe a an abstract thought that you know we know that people get ill we know that people have accidents and um but actually you know this kind of internal feeling of invincibility is something that most of us you know just unknowingly have um until we don't um and that you know can take quite a lot of of getting used to kind of the kind of reality of you know actually we're not not invincible um yeah um so so where are you now with treatment and everything have you had to have? so I had my nine hour brain surgery and then I had uh six weeks of um adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy every day um and then I had a month off which was lovely um my mum and I uh did lots of lovely things together she had a month off work Uh, And then I had six months of maintenance chemo, which was five days a month uh, and then 23 days off, which I finished in July. And so that's where I am with treatment. Um, And I just got that promotion about, you know, just over a month ago that I was supposed to get a year ago. (laughs) Um, um, I've had my third scan since surgery showing no evidence of disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, really at the beginning, I couldn't imagine a life with cancer. The two things were mutually exclusive. And now not only do I have a life with cancer, I've found a way to live with it. And, you know, my life is by no means the same as it was before my diagnosis, but now neither is it remarkably different. Um, Actually, the biggest change really is that I've just signed up to a 35 year mortgage. (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> despite my uh, 14 month standard life expectancy <laughs> <laughs> it's a um yeah, congratulations for that because I think that's uh you know especially in these times it's quite difficult to to think about those things and to like you know planning planning 35 years ahead I mean you know um but uh, <laughs> um, that's that's great news though um but I mean I think you know what you said about kind of living a life with cancer like living with the with the type of diagnosis that you've got you know have you found that do, do people your friends and family kind of understand that or um... so people generally no. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand they assume that you're out and about and therefore that you must be better mm-hmm. and um the best I've ever been able to explain to people and also to myself you know because my um cancer is incurable that incurable element that you know thing of never being able to be better yeah. is by comparing to asthma actually weirdly enough okay um just because 
you have asthma, that does not mean that you are always having an asthma attack. And just because you are not having an asthma attack, that does not mean that you no longer have asthma. The thing about asthma is that you are always at risk of having an asthma attack. And that is the burden that you carry with you um, and that fear element. And it's weird how actually bringing it to something that many more people kind of have or that we talk a bit more openly about and that people don't mind so much sharing actually that kind of gets through to people and I think the thing I found really interesting about that way of explaining it was that it also helped me understand it as well as people around me um and then on the other hand once other people comprehend the seriousness of my diagnosis they then assume that I must be living my life to some sort of like bucket list <laughs> and, yeah. and they don't seem to understand that for me just having a lovely night in with a takeaway um with faith my family all my friends after a long day at work is actually a really big deal <laughs> um, and it was those little things that we together lost and that I now know are the big things and people don't seem to understand that you can be very well and extraordinarily sick at the same time they always want you to sort of live in these extremes um, and the best way that I can, uh, I've ever found, again, Nina Simone, you're going to come with a running theme here. I love Nina Simone. <laughs> um, she wrote a song called Everybody's Gone to the Moon, um, which is sort of how, it's about how um, the world around you sort of looks the same as everyone else's, but it doesn't quite mad match up. It's full of these contradictions. And the first sort of verse goes, streets full of people all alone, uh, roads full of houses, never home, church full of singing out of tune everyone's gone to the moon and that's really how it felt for the most part but what I would say is everyone had gone to the moon except for my immediate friends and family who very much went through it with me and felt a lot of that loss even if it wasn't directly happening to them yeah. um, but otherwise it's this weird world where you live and are able to live um, a very normal and mundane life and yet somehow it's just not quite aligned to everyone else's the healthy populations yeah. shall we absolutely. say absolutely yeah it, and it's it's really um fascinating the way you describe it I think it's you know it, it it's um should make it understandable for other people we need to quote those and you know blast them all over social media or something but it's a uh, you know it's interesting the the asthma um comparison uh, I like that way of, of describing it because uh, you know we know that that people do have those expectations of you know cancer patients um, and normally it's you know someone who's really sick in a headscarf um, even if you know quite a lot of treatment doesn't even result in hair loss right for different cancer types so um, and then also the kind of expectations that that you you're diagnosed with cancer you have some treatment and then you're better and you know x number of weeks later you're back to normal and you can forget it ever happened and um you know a lot of people and and you know myself included I think that's the pressure that we put on ourselves and also that you know society I guess thinks of of cancer patients or survivors or people that have recovered or um is kind of the narrative we see isn't it it's, absolutely yeah. yeah and actually I just wanted to ask Kieran I mean Obviously, your your situation is different to Jesse's, but I'm wondering how you found the kind of process of recovery. I mean, physically and emotionally, but also, you know, the understanding of your friends or people around you. Yeah, um, that was stunning, by the way, Jesse. That was really, really nice to listen to. Um, what a story! So, yeah, mine is. Um, listen, I I I came out. Of chemo as as quickly as you could have wanted with a, an all clear diagnosis um but I was in going in I was in something I didn't know quite what it was so I was the, I, I went through probably a two-year depression um after the all clear during the all clear so my recovery was physically with long it just took so long for my hands and my feet to recover to the point where I wasn't in daily pain where I could open an Evian bottle with my hands without specialized gloves. I, I, I was in therapy, suicide prevention counseling for nine months. Um, I had the other thing going on in the back of my mind with, with, you know, I remember I was in recovery for drugs and alcohol before cancer. I, I, I was up there. 
I was, I was, I just felt like a mess. Um, I watched 140 episodes of Friends in two weeks after the all clear. I didn't leave my bedroom except obviously uh, the stuff you have to. That was it. I was in. That wasn't actually that bad, but um, it took a long time to look myself in the mirror and not feel kind of like ugly, and um, you know, just a complete. I was shattered. I was shattered. With regards to friends and family who were exceptional, apart from a few obviously slips here and there, like, oh, that's a good cancer to have, mate, and stuff like that. Apart from that, a couple of them, they were amazing. My mother was was a rock for me. Uh, it's like, I can never explain what she did for me emotionally. What happened quite quickly was because I got the all clear, quick, all clear quickly and not everyone understood what I was going through mentally and emotionally was that the calls, the texts, the, the check-ins, physical, the knocks on the door, the can I bring you food, that dried up real quick, real, real, within weeks. Um, that all stopped after, the, after I said I've got the all clear. And then that really affected me because then I felt really, really alone. I then started to feel quite isolated again and not being able to talk about where I was. But fortunately, I found something within with my therapist and I said to a few people, including my mum, that I eventually said before Christmas, I was living the all clear in August. I said, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm depressed and I've got problems going on in mental health. So then I was able to bring a few into the inner inner circle and then regularly express where I, where I truthfully was at on that day and that moment. Yeah. And that's tough to do sometimes, isn't it? Because, you know, like we said, people are expect us to be you know back to normal or the and I think um Jesse you touched on it as well when you said like people think you, you know you look all right um and you you look well and you know we hear that quite a lot we've got a cancer catchphrase bingo which includes but you look so well um and I think you know a lot of people kind of relate to that and people like the people like the narrative that okay you've had treatment you're better we don't ever need to talk about cancer again and I think you know it can it, it often does take somebody actually saying, do you know what, I actually need help with this or I'm not okay still. And that's a, you know, a tough conversation to have with people, isn't it? Yes, yes. I found with the hair thing, when I was bald, I talk about it with my therapist at the time, I didn't want my hair to grow back for, for about six weeks because I noticed as it was growing back, people kept commenting on it. And then they're like, oh, your hair's growing back. This is really good. And I said to my therapist, it's like, I don't, I want to look like I've got cancer, even though I don't. So at least people care about me. Like, you know what I mean? I, I just, I, I just felt, I just, I was, yeah, I can't believe I just said that. So that's, that's the way it was. And then it came back really curly and really good looking and like really thick, best hair I've ever had. But I had it for like nine months before it started to fall out. Um, and when I had the curly hair, everyone's like, oh, wow, you you really bounced back. And yeah, um, yeah it was funny in hindsight. I, I think that's exactly the thing though isn't it that sometimes the kind of the inside and the outside don't match and actually sometimes when you're I mean I certainly think for myself and I've heard this from a lot of people when you're in the middle of cancer treatment um, sometimes you're on a you're on a treadmill and you keep going you've got all these people around you kind of propping you up and keeping you going um, and then when that finishes whatever that looks like whether it's that you get a break in treatment or your hair starts to grow back and everyone does go oh amazing great you know oh you're done time to time to climb Kilimanjaro or run a marathon and you know that's what people who have cancer or have recovered do um that I think can be a really tough place and that's the where the loneliness comes in because people don't understand it. And, and also, I think for a lot of people, I mean, I guess we have to realize, you know, a lot of people do have experience of cancer, maybe they've had a friend or a relative die, it can be very difficult for themselves to think, you know, oh, my friend is in this position, could this be me? And, and they, you know, so people do, do fall away. Um, I mean, Jesse, how, how have your friends and family been through all of this? Well, they've been fantastic like close friends and family you know and my mum as well just as Kieran was giving a nice shout out to, to his um my mum has been just incredible so is Faith um and so have quite a lot of my really immediate close friends some expect some who I would have expected and some who I would never have guessed <laughs> um, 
Um, and I think, but you know, the sort of wider extended set of people, you know, I've certainly had some people who were originally really good and that incurable element, even with my lovely can um, asthma sort of analogy, they get it, but they don't want to accept it. And they, they do just want me to be better. And I can reflect on the fact that that's because of how they are coping with it. And that's partly their feelings. Um, it doesn't make it any easier for me. Um, but it's also, you know, it at least helps to know that it doesn't come from a malicious place. And otherwise, I tend to just make a bit of a nuisance of myself with people who are maybe who maybe sort of were there a lot during my when I first got diagnosed and then the treatment, but who, you know, like colleagues, for example, who lived through it, but weren't sort of close to me and therefore now just see me as better. I just make a real nuisance of myself and I, I will just talk about it very openly, very candidly and kind of sort of make sure that people know, to be honest. Um, and it's it kind of feels like it's really difficult because on the one hand, just like Kieran was saying, you want people to know what you're dealing with. You want people to know that you're sick. And I didn't lose my hair. I lost a patch of hair. And actually, I've also a patch of it has grown back curly. So I now have this sort of curly undercut, um, <laughs> which um, is quite entertaining. And also because it was from the radiotherapy, it's a patch on one side and then the exit side as well which is also <laughs> quite entertaining um so I have one ringlet on this side and then a whole undercut under here um so on one hand you want people to be able to see that you're unwell but on the other you also don't want them to treat you any differently um and I find that a difficult line to toe not in terms of how people treat me but in how I conduct myself almost and in the messages that I want to communicate to people um and I have been asked at work you know how do you what can we do? And I'm sort of like, well, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really difficult because it's exactly right. It's that balance between treat me as normally as possible, but also recognize that maybe I, I am going to have days where I don't feel well or I need extra support. And, and that can be hard. I think actually what you're doing is probably, I mean, there is no right answer to this, but, you know, making people aware so that when you're having a good day, everyone's like, great, it's a good day. And then when you have a bad day that people can recognize, yeah, OK, this is something you're living with and you can be tired. And I think those effects as well. I mean, even when you do get the all clear or no evidence of disease or whatever you're living with, you know, it's cancer has a very long tail. And so, so many people we speak to say, oh, I thought I would bounce back. <laughs> Um, and I don't think there is a bouncing back. I think you you adjust and you live with things and your life changes. Um, but in a weird kind of way, there is no going back to where you were before. And that's that's not always bad. There will be some good things that come out of that. But, you know, it's a, it's tough because we probably liked most people liked where they were in life when this happened. And so, you know, to have a huge disruption where they're like, oh, well, you know, you're looking at death. I mean, that's a that's a big thing, especially when you're when you're younger. Um, but one thing we wanted to ask both of you actually is, um, you know, obviously you're here now and we're really just so grateful. And you, I hope you can see in the comments that people have said, you know, how much they appreciate hearing from you, because I think, you know, like Emma said at the beginning, we don't often hear these stories. We don't hear the, you know, the whole story enough. Um, you, you read a story of somebody who's recovered and done something amazing or somebody who <laughs> sadly passed away but you don't get the the messy in between and so it's really important to hear this but what sort of things do you think have helped you cope and Kieran maybe if I can just go to you first what um you know if you were thinking about what's what's kept you going what would you what would you tell other people mm, um what's kept me going all right so one thing that's helped a lot is having therapy that that at times has been something I look forward to, even when I was really, really depressed and anxious. Um, so I definitely would recommend that. I've no, like, um, I think it's a good thing. I think therapy is like got this, it's changing, but the reputation is still kind of awkward sometimes, sign of weakness perhaps, but I love it. So I, I'm a big therapy guy. So if you, if you haven't had it, get it. If you have it and it's not quite for you, there's another therapist out there. So that's, been my number one thing that's kept me going um what was the question <laughs> um well what's kept you going what's helped you to kind of process you know your whole experience and, and keep you going 
I mean, therapy is a big one. And I think that's, that's really important. And what you said actually about, you know, if you've tried therapy and maybe oh, didn't, maybe it didn't fit I, with, with you try another therapist because. I'll tell, I, I tell, I tell, I tell you what it's been. It's been finding some aspect that I can enjoy and g- grabbing it. So at the start, I was dripping, during chemo, I was dripping THC oil. I did that for a couple of months after, and it wasn't to stimulate my appetite, it's to get high. That was it, I was depressed, and I wanted to watch Friends and do stuff like that. I enjoyed that. Then it stopped. Then I found therapy, or the therapy started to become more enjoyable. Then that stopped being enjoyable, and it's more part why I need this. Then it was, I could, I, then, then specifically around the, the autumn, I started going for walks in the park when I was stronger, six months after, with a friend, with his dog. I didn't particularly like the dog, but I liked the walks in the park and I liked being around the animal and observing him. Then I started to go f- to, to, to see my, my auntie, whose husband was dying or was sick. Every, every few months looking back now, there was something that I could cling to and enjoy, even though I felt my life was a pile of shit. So even though 98% was awful I felt two percent little things here a McDonald's takeaway once a month because I developed that taste for it during chemo I didn't eat McDonald's before cancer it disgusted me because it was so unhealthy now I can't live without at least touching it at least once a month or once every two months but I went through a McDonald's phase then I found a cafe down the road that I started to go down to and um where I was broke waiting for my benefits to come through a Muslim guy and they're into this thing of like helping people in need. He started to give me free food. So I started to go down there and talk to him about my life. And then I got, then I, you know, I got my first haircut after a year. And then I started to enjoy getting shaved again by the barber. So it, it, it was no magic thing. It was little things. And I just thought, I'll end on this. I just thought after about six months when I stopped having the bad thoughts, I started just to think like, what the fuck have I done this for? My, I don't enjoy life right now, but I'm enjoying little bits. Maybe in six months, I'll enjoy 10% of my life or 20%. It's, it's, it's slowly, I'm either gonna just get, what's the point? If, if I've gone through the treatment and I haven't died and I've been given the all clear, just grim and bear it and try and keep going and keep praying and keep watching Eckhart Tolle and Jordan Peterson and motivational videos that just, that was it, YouTube find those videos that work for you and don't give up and, and try and love yourself again and can i just say i know you didn't like your friend's dog but you do have a cat now right yeah he's starting to cry a little bit he's been amazing yeah. half an hour <laughs> and he hasn't scratched at the door this has never happened before <laughs> never and now um, he's i have to think kieran all. does have the world's cutest kitten i might have to ask you to get him for the end because he's 14 yeah. weeks old percy right yeah, Percy. Yeah, he's adorable. And I think actually pets can be an amazing kind of tonic as well because they can't talk back and they just kind of, they just want to, well, actually my cat doesn't really want to be that close to me, but he likes me when I'm feeding him. So, you know, it can be, and that can be a joy as well. Um, Jesse, what about you? What's kind of helped you keep going? Yeah, so I want to echo a lot of the things that Kieran was saying there about therapy um, and, you know, Uh, also like your needs changing and meeting those needs and also um you know the future is uncertain that can also be a positive thing as much as it can be a negative thing um so echoing all of that and the thing I think that I would add so it's actually one of the only kind of nuggets of advice about emotional the emotional side effects of a cancer diagnosis that any sort of medical professional has given me um and my oncologist said to me the day that I got diagnosed, you have to own this. And at that point, I was so consumed by fear and anger that I thought I would never laugh or smile again. Um, Faith uh, made me a birthday card. It was my 24th birthday on the 25th of October, 2021. Um, And she made me a card of all of the things that we'd lost that we were gonna get back. And those are a variety of really mundane things. One of which was a picture of a telly with the words BBC iPlayer written in the middle. Life was so bleak that we couldn't even watch telly. (laughs) Um, 
and um it was my 25th birthday on the funnily enough 25th of october <laughs> 2022 um and she made me a card all of the things that we'd done since and right there pride of place a tv with bbc iplayer in the middle um, so how did i get from not being able to watch tv to having just taken on a 35 year mortgage um, so for me the biggest thing like kieran was talking about youtube for me it was music um, and American civil rights jazz in particular. At first, it was the anger and fear of that that resonated with me. And then I sort of learned something from it. I took something from it. Pride, that kind of sense of owning your diagnosis. Cancer doesn't define who I am, but it is one of the biggest parts of my life. And it affects how I interact with the world and the people in it and how they interact with me. And Therefore, it is a part of who I am and who I will become. You know, like you were saying, um, Kamri and Emma, about, you know, it doesn't go away. It, even if you have a curable cancer and you get the all clear, it's something that will always continue to affect your life and an experience that you've gone through. Um, and that is OK, <laughs> was the biggest kind of realisation I had and, and owning that and being proud of that and that. Pride helped me to think about cancer, not in terms of the end of my life, but as a part of my life, as a characteristic and a quality that I now have with me that I can be proud of. And that until the end of my life arrives, whether it's premature and caused by cancer or premature and caused by something else or <laughs> very long and, you know, actually pretty unremarkable. Um, until that happens, I'm a person living with cancer not dying from it um and so you know with that in my mind faith and i tune into eastenders every night <laughs> to watch lola's glioblastoma storyline for anyone who watches um eastenders uh and i think you know i think i if anyone read the bio that i wrote about myself yeah it was nina simone's song um i ain't got no i got life it was you know it's so easy to think about the things that cancer takes away and it's important to acknowledge those things and that's where the therapy comes in and that's where you know talking about these things and a lot of the messages that Kieran has shared um, really come in but that's not all that the cancer is and that's not all that your life is you can acknowledge the things it's taken away but you can also acknowledge the things that you still have and are still able to do and not let cancer take those things away from you as well because of the emotional side effects. Mm -hmm. And for me, music was the way that I was able to do that. But it varies for everyone. No, that's great. Music Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, go ahead, Emma. I was just going to say music taste varies too, right? I think um, I mean, maybe we'll all go and um, find a bit of Nina Simone though um, after this one, just for a reminder. But yeah, thank you so much. That I'm just conscious of the time. We're already um, five minutes from the end of, of this session. So um I One guess. thing that we did want to oh, there's Percy. See, oh. there we can see Percy. <laughs> now he's so cute. Hi, Percy. Oh, he is gorgeous. <laughs> okay, we've got a kitten now. <laughs> but those are the moments of joy. I think you know we have to take, and whether that's a McDonald's or Nino Simone or playing with your kitten, you know, those do make life. That's what life is, actually you know, all of those small moments. I did just want to ask you before we finish, um, I know both of you obviously, you know, have been a part of the Shine community for a while, um, but I was wondering um, if you could maybe just say a little bit, um, I'll go to, to Kieran first about, Kieran, you were part of the breakout program and I think you you came to Shine Camp. Um, with, that was your first ever Shine event. But how did, what's been your experience of, of being part of the Shine community? Because I, I think people do worry sometimes. They think, oh, I, I don't know if I want to be part of that because it's going to be really depressing. <laughs> yeah, it's the best thing, I, best thing I did. I, um, in short, for a couple of years, I withheld from the Shine community because I, I didn't feel I had the... the the good cancer story like the tv one because you only hear the ones on tv about like kilimanjaro and bacon brownies and fun runs so i just felt i wasn't worthy to be part of it and then and then i finally went to the camp well i went to the camp it was my first ever shine thing and it just changed my life everything everything since then like it doesn't stop me getting depressed moods and stuff and being anxious like and blah 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 but 
it's it's only been a positive experience of shine and it's just changed my life i feel so happy to be connected so i i don't feel alone i got to share my story around like marshmallows and 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 um what's it called open fires and i listened i listened 90 percent, and i spoke 10 percent. and that listening allowed me to identify that i'm not alone and I, i've seen some of the comments flash up I'm not the only one who hasn't felt worthy or has had mental health issues or just hasn't woken up every day and been like, oh my God, I'm so grateful to be alive. Like that's it's 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 normal to have feelings that don't make it make them the movie cut. You know what I mean? So I feel good. The breakout program gave me real insight into other people's reactions to people, places, and things during cancer, post-cancer. It, I, I just now don't, I never have the thought anymore, which I plagued me for years as was, why am I not recovering right? Mm. Yeah. I don't have that no more. Oh, thank you, Karen. And Jesse, what about you? Because the Circles program is our online program for people living with incurable cancer. Um, and again, I mean, I think that can sound like a scary thing, <laughs> a scary thing to join. Um, but how did you find it? there are sort of like two main bits to it that I like I mean I absolutely love the circles program um I mean goes without saying hence that I'm here um but um the sort of first bit is and this applies to all shine events but particularly in a context where everybody has incurable cancer and um you know is just the kind of equality um between everybody and I just feel like in social situations there's always a kind of inequality in the sort of emotional power that you hold, because on the one hand, you're talking to somebody who, as far as you know, anyway, um, is, and as possibly as far as they know, um, fit, completely fit and healthy. And um, that sort of gives them a kind of one up on you. But on the other hand, you also hold, hold the control and the power to change the emotional dynamic of that situation at any moment. And that's that's quite a lot to carry um and so to be in a context where it's normal and actually you can just talk to people and you can name drop your cancer and they're just like oh yeah so what <laughs> you know um that's one one part of it and being able to you know have a space um to talk in a way that kind of puts a framework to your thoughts so it's not just a kind of sporadic conversation but actually helps to sort of rationalize some of the things that you're talking about um, and to make links and, you know, like Kieran was saying, find similarities with people um, and feel a bit better about the things that you might have previously thought you, only you were going through. Turns out everyone is. But on the other hand, to also understand, to hear other people's kind of stories, because it's not all the same. And even in, a, in a, you know, here, Kieran and, and my story are quite different, um, even if there are similarities. That's also true, even if you're talking to somebody with exactly the same cancer as you have. Um, and, you know, that could be maybe they're a parent and you're not or that they had this symptom and you didn't. And so actually to hear other people, what other people have been through, because there's always more to learn, you know, even if you're an expert in your own story. Great. Thank you so much. And I think actually that's, we're out of time, but that is the perfect note to end on that there's always more to learn. Um, certainly Emma and I are still learning. Um, and hopefully the rest of the conference is an opportunity for everyone to kind of join in and learn the next two sessions we have. Um, we've got one which is self-massage with Tatum. So that's a break. Um, if you, if she'll show you kind of how you can press different parts of your body. I always feel like this sounds vaguely, you know, sexual, but anyway, um, <laughs> you'll learn how to make yourself feel good um, with Tatum. That's at 11.30. Um, and then Emma, you've got a session coming up as well. Um, yeah, also at 11.30 is the Shine Connected session. Um, so that one's more of a, a meetup, a chance to kind of um, speak to other people and chat and share your experiences. And it's for um, young adults with cancer that are from the Black, Asian or other minoritized ethnic groups. Um, so we have a regular meetup quarterly. Um, and so we decided to do it as part of Shine Connect this year. Um, so yeah, join um, me and Mira and um, whoever else will be there um, at 11.30. Uh, and then we've got our keynote speaker at two as well. So we hope you can join us. But Jesse and Kieran, I just want to end by saying, you know, it's 
we really appreciate it. It's not easy to speak about the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Um, so having you here and talking so openly, you know, Emma and I really appreciate it. And you can see, I hope from the comments, how much everyone else has appreciated it. Um, and yeah, take care of yourselves. We're so glad that you're, you're part of our community. Um, we hope to see you at other sessions. Um, send us some photos of Percy, Karen. Um, Jesse, keep watching EastEnders. Um, and everyone else, we will see you soon. So thank you so much for joining us for this first session. Thank you all so much. Yeah, God thanks bless. so much for coming and thanks for having us. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank Have you. a great day, everyone. Take care.